Hello and welcome to History of the Universe, the basics. This video covers an outline of the current theory of the evolution of the universe. This is called the Standard Hot Big Bang Model. And I'll also talk about how this model is supported by our current observations. The video has no complicated mathematics and is suitable for a beginner with only a very basic understanding of science. If you want a bit more technical detail, then have a look at the Brief History of the Universe video on my YouTube channel, Explaining Science. The Big Bang itself isn't a new theory. It's been around over 90 years since Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian astronomer, came up with it in 1931. He called it the primeval atom. And it's been gradually developed and refined, improving the theory over the last 90 years or so to give us a theory which fits the observations well. In this video, I'm going to focus on the evolution of the universe, starting not at the beginning, the very beginning, but from when the time the universe was one second old. And the reason for this is quite simple. The detail about what happens is better agreed and it's far easier to understand. So this is what we're going to be covering. Don't worry if some of the names for the things on the left hand side are complicated. I'll explain them in this video in quite simple terms. All objects we see are made up of atoms. Atoms consist of a nucleus, which has positively charged electrons, and neutrons, which have no electric charge. The nucleus is surrounded by a cloud of negatively charged electrons. And because there are the same number of protons with a positive charge and electrons with a negative charge, an atom has no net electric charge. Now, Although diagrams such as this, which shows a carbon atom with six protons, six neutrons and six electrons are widely used, they're actually a little bit of an oversimplification. Diagram shows a large nucleus. In fact, the nucleus is much, much smaller than the atom. It's 100,000 times smaller than the diameter of the atom. So you wouldn't actually be able to see it in the diagram at all. The other thing is electrons don't orbit the nucleus in nice, neat orbits. They exist in a probability cloud. But even so, diagrams like this are widely used and easy to understand. The number of protons in the nucleus determines the type of atom it is. Atoms which have one proton, regardless of the number of neutrons, surrounded by one electron, are hydrogen atoms. Atoms with two protons, helium, three protons, lithium, four, beryllium, and so on. The number of protons in the atomic nucleus is called the atomic number and determines the atom's position in the periodic table. For example, a nucleus with eight protons is an oxygen atom, chemical symbol O. An atom with 26 protons is an iron atom, chemical symbol Fe for the Latin ferrum for iron. Although everything we see in our day-to-day -day life is made up of atoms, if atoms become hot enough then they can lose one or more of the electrons. They become ionized. Let's take the example of helium. If one of the electrons escapes from the helium atom, we're left with the nucleus with two protons, but only one electron orbiting the nucleus. In this case, the total charge is plus one. Helium ions are normally written He1+. If the iron gets hot enough, it can actually lose both the electrons. So we're just left with two protons and two neutrons. 
This is written HE2 plus. Matter at very high temperatures doesn't consist of atoms, but of ions and electrons, and this state of matter is known as a plasma. If we take the example of oxygen, there are three kinds of oxygen atoms found in nature. Oxygen 16 has eight protons and eight neutrons in its nucleus, but there's also oxygen 17 and oxygen 18. Atoms which have the same number of protons and different number of neutrons are isotopes. All isotopes of oxygen have the same chemical properties. For instance, they all form water with hydrogen, H2O. When we want to distinguish between isotopes, we use a little number which tells us the atomic weight. That's the number of protons and neutrons added together in the nucleus. So 16O is the chemical symbol for a particular isotope of oxygen, oxygen 16. Most elements exist as more than one isotope. For example, hydrogen exists as normal hydrogen, 1H, and 2H, heavy hydrogen, which is also known as deuterium. We are all surrounded by electromagnetic radiation. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays are all type of, of electromagnetic radiation caused by varying electromagnetic fields. The only difference between them is the wavelengths. The longest wavelengths are radio waves and the shortest wavelengths are gamma rays which are normally emitted by the decay of radioactive atoms. In addition to electromagnetic radiation emitted by things like radio transmitters or x-ray machines or UV lamps, all objects emit electromagnetic radiation as a result of the temperature. The hotter an object is, the shorter of the wavelength of the radiation it emits. For example, if we have an object at 20 degrees room temperature, its radiation is mainly in infrared. An object of five and a half thousand degrees, that's roughly the temperature of the sun, will be emitting mainly in the visible light. If you go to higher temperatures, then objects are emitting in the ultraviolet X-ray. And if we go up to a temperature of a billion degrees, then an object will be emitting mainly in gamma rays. At one second old, the universe was almost unimaginably hot. Its temperature was 100 billion degrees. For comparison, the centre of the sun, where it generates all its energy, is only 15 million degrees. The observable universe was much smaller. It's now 92 billion light years in diameter. At one second old, it was only 0.1 of the light year. It was far too hot for atoms or even atomic nuclei to exist. It consisted of a sea of separately moving protons, neutrons and electrons and very light particles called neutrinos, all moving extremely fast. We also think there are dark matter particles in the early universe. Even now, we know very little about them. The universe was packed full of gamma rays. In fact, because radiation has mass, most of the mass of the universe wasn't in these particles, but was actually in the form of these extremely energetic gamma rays. All the time the universe was expanding and cooling. When it got to about 10 seconds old, its temperature dropped to 15, 20 billion degrees. At this temperature, protons and neutrons can stick together to form atomic nuclei without the nuclei being blasted apart straight away by collisions. In effect, the entire universe was like a giant nuclear reactor when it was between 10 seconds and 15 minutes old. 
If you look at this diagram here, it shows how helium can be made from hydrogen in the early universe. The first stage is remember that the universe was a sea of protons and neutrons and other particles. So a proton or hydrogen nucleus combines with a neutron to form deuterium or heavy hydrogen. This has one proton and one neutron in its nucleus. The deuterium then combines with another hydrogen nucleus or proton to give an isotope of helium. This is called helium-3. This helium isotope has two protons and one neutron. The helium-3 then combines with another proton, with another neutron, sorry, to form helium-4, ordinary helium, which has two protons and two neutrons in its nucleus. At each stage in the process, a massive amount of energy is released. The lower part of the diagram shows a different route to go from hydrogen to helium-4, um, but the end route is the same. You, you start with hydrogen and neutrons and you get to helium-4 with a vast amount of energy being released. When the universe was 15 minutes old, its temperature had dropped to only 1 billion degrees. At this temperature, the um, nuclear fusion could no longer take place. It was too cold for this to happen. So the composition of the universe was frozen at 73% hydrogen, 27% helium, and a small amount of other elements, mainly lithium. There was also dark matter particles, um, the nature of which is still unknown. But if we look at the mass of the universe, it was mainly in the form of energetic gamma rays. It was far too hot for individual atoms to exist. So it was in the form of a plasma, which are atomic nuclei and electrons. Electromagnetic radiation, such as light and radio waves, can't pass through a plasma. However, as the universe expanded and cooled, at 380,000 years, it had cooled down enough for individual atoms to exist. The universe was no longer a plasma. It was a mixture of hydrogen and helium gases. And electromagnetic radiation can pass through such a gas. So if you look at the universe when it was 380,000 years old, had a temperature of 2,700 degrees, its atomic makeup was still 73% hydrogen atoms, 27% helium atoms, trace amounts of other elements like lithium, and dark matter particles, the nature of which we still don't know what they are. And it was a mass-dominated universe. The mass was mainly in the form of dark matter and atoms. And because of its temperature, the atoms were emitting energy in infrared or visible light wavelengths. There weren't any of the short energetic rays such as X-rays or gamma rays. The radiation we now observe as the cosmic microwave background is a relic from when the universe was 380 thousand years old. If you want to know more about this then look at my more technical video, A Brief History of the Universe. Interestingly the microwave background was predicted way back in 1948 but no serious attempt had been made to search for it. It was accidentally discovered by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson in 1964 as a source of interference. Its discovery proved confirmation that the Big Bang theory is correct because in the early 50s and 60s the rival steady state theory was popular. Over the next 100 million years or so the universe continued to expand and get colder and colder. By the time it was 100 million years old its temperature was minus 210 degrees. 
and it was a cold, dark place. As the universe continued to expand and cool, matter began to clump together. When it was about 200, 300 million years old, large clumps of matter existed, which were around about 100 to 300 times the mass of the sun. These clumps of matter contracted, getting hotter and hotter. And as they did so, eventually nuclear reactions started and the first stars were born. These early stars, which astronomers call population three stars, were supermassive compared to the sun and shone extremely brightly for about 10 million years. This is a short lifetime compared to the sun, which will last for about 10 billion years. They ended their lives in massive explosions called supernovae, in which the star was completely destroyed. These supernovae spread the elements like carbon throughout the cosmos. If we look at all the elements found in nature, it was only hydrogen, helium and lithium which were formed in the first 15 minutes by the nuclear synthesis we've talked about earlier. All the other elements such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron were formed inside stars and were spread throughout the cosmos in supernovae. It's still not fully understood how galaxies, many of which contain hundreds of billions of stars, form. One theory which has gained strength in recent years is the bottom-up theory. According to this, the first galaxies began to form when the universe was around about 300 million years old, from lumps of matter including stars and gas clouds which had coalesced. Although we don't know what dark matter is, it plays, plays a key role in this theory. Without it, the gravitational collapse to galaxies just doesn't happen in a reasonable time scale. As our universe continues to evolve, small galaxies are frequently gobbled up by larger ones. The Milky Way contains the remains of several smaller galaxies that is swallowed up during its long lifetime. In fact, the Milky Way is digesting at least two smaller galaxies even now and may pull others in over the next few billion years. The Milky Way is believed to date from just over a billion years after the Big Bang. Around the Milky Way is a halo containing old stars called Population 2 stars, which don't have many elements other than hydrogen and helium. The small traces of heavier elements in them will have come from earlier Population 3 stars. Because elements such as iron, oxygen and silicon are only pre present in minute quantities in these Population 2 stars, they cannot be orbited by rocky planets such as Earth, Mars and Venus. The disk of the galaxy and the central bulge contain younger Population 1 stars like the Sun. And these are much richer in heavy elements and are likely to have planets. The first Population 1 stars appeared 8 billion years ago. Much of the material in the Population 1 stars and the planets has been recycled. It will have been created in earlier Population 2 and Population 3 stars, which exploded as supernovae, scattering the debris throughout the universe. Some of this debris later clumped together to form stars and planets, such as our Earth. This phrase was taken by a book, from a book by the British popular science writer John Gribben. We are literally stardust. Here's a few key milestones in the formation of the solar system, Earth and life itself. The Sun formed round about 4.6 billion years ago. Earth-Moon system a little bit later, probably around about 4.53 billion years ago. The first simple life forms emerged soon after the formation of the Earth, probably around 4.3 billion years ago. The first mammals, 250 million years ago and Homo sapiens itself emerged from the plains of Africa only 300,000 years ago.